was six at the time. My, my, I had an older sister. She was eight, and my younger sister was three. We came to Canada in the 1960s, I guess like many other immigrants, um, for a better life. My family was living on a farm, a beach farm in southeast England. It was part of a larger estate owned by Sir John Spencer Wills. And we were happy. It was a great place to grow up. Um, but Dad realized uh, he would never progress further than farm manager. Uh, and he had dreams of owning his own farm someday. So his plan was to emigrate to either New Zealand or Canada and to come as a farm laborer and save money and eventually save up enough money to own his own farm. In October of 1968, he applied for a position uh, in Canada and two weeks later he was offered the job and was asked to start in six weeks. So uh, there was a big flurry of activity. We had to give away, sell most of our belongings. We needed our passport photo taken. And then suddenly on January the 11th, 1969, we we're on our way to Canada. At that time at Ottawa Airport, you disembarked directly onto the tarmac and we got out and it was like frigid, a real shock to the system. And we were met by dad's new boss, Mr. Van Dan Lush. And uh, he stood in stark contrast to dad's previous employer. He had a sort of uh, disheveled look. He whisked us all into his sedan, and soon we're on our way to uh, just outside Manatic. As we're driving, uh, Van Dan Lush chatted amiably, you know, saying, I, I love immigrant workers, he enthused, because they work so hard. Uh, he himself had emigrated from Holland 17 years previously. We pulled into the driveway of a house at Claire Van Farm, owned by Van Dan Lush. It was all dark. Uh, we've been traveling for 17 hours by this point. There was um, brick patterned tar paper peeling off the outside and the whole building kind of tilted slightly. So we, we got out, went, in, went into the house and um, on the kitchen counter there was a box of stale donuts, a kettle and some tea bags. And mum went to turn on the tap and a gush of rusty brown water came pouring out. Then Dan Lush, after showing my dad how to work the furnace, he said, uh, okay, Alan, I expect you to be at work first thing in the morning. <laughs> dad realized within the first two hours of arriving at the dairy farm that we had made a, a terrible mistake. The conditions on the farm were primitive. <laughs> Nothing could have prepared us for the, the bitter cold and uh, you know, the, the endless snow that, that swept across the farm fields. The snow banks grew so high, they actually obliterated stop signs. And I remember at night being flattened by layer after layer of blankets. And then on top of that, layer after layer of coats. Our situation was pretty bleak. Uh, we were completely isolated. We had no near neighbors. Uh, we had no friends or family living in Canada even, so far as we knew. But it was not possible to, to return. Um, for one thing, we still owed the airfare to the Canadian government for coming to Canada. So that was quite an expense. Um, but perhaps a bigger obstacle was um, more ego-related. My father has a brother named Norman, and one of the last things he said to Dad when we were leaving is, oh, you'll be back within six months. So, um, you know, Dad, ever competitive, could not prove Uncle Norman to be right in that. So uh, we persevered, and uh, meanwhile, Mum wrote these bright, breezy letters home about the wonders of snow and how well the girls were settling into their new school. Mom kept her feelings to her, herself for the, for the most part, but she, it must have been a terrible experience, for sure. In March, Dad spent $250 on uh, a 1960 Ford Zephyr. Uh, so that gave us a little bit of opportunity to escape, at least for a day, temporarily, our situation. And we go on day trips to Ottawa and to the Gatineau Hills. Um, uh, the car had a few idiosyncrasies. For one thing, uh, the heat didn't work very well. So mom would have to be forever, you know, scraping the inside of the windshield so that dad could see out well enough to drive. 
Um, but I think <laughs> the biggest frustration with the car was that most of the time it, it, it didn't work. It was just too cold. Um, but it wasn't all doom and gloom. You know, we had a roof over our heads and, you know, we always had food on the table. One day I remember our family going to a small art exhibit at the Manatee Public Library. My mom and dad, in a, in a rare and rash act of extravagance, <laughs> purchased an oil painting. Uh, it was a painting of three sunflowers floating uh, gently on a, in a sea of uh, inky blackness. And uh, it was painted by the school principal's wife, Mrs. Kelly. And my parents spent the, their last $50 of savings on this, on this painting. Uh, Dad later justified it, saying that we needed something uh, uplifting uh, in our lives at that time. You know, the, the, the dreary house, the, the never-ending winter, the, the state of the farm. Uh, it was all leading us into kind of a feeling of despondency, like a black hole. Uh, and in my six-year-old mind, that is when really our luck changed after we purchased that painting. Winter finally lost its harsh grip and one day dad opened the basement door to, to go down for something and was flabbergasted to see water floating to the top stair. And <laughs> floating ironically on the top was a pair of um, rubber boots. <laughs> Well, at least now we knew why the uh, furnace was on the ceiling of the basement. Good evening. This is The World at Six. From CBC News, Toronto. Shortly afterwards, Roger Dad was uh, sitting in his Ford Zephyr in the driveway, the listening to the CBC uh, radio 6 o'clock news, as you do when you don't have a house radio. <laughs> And uh, he heard a, a crunching of gravel, and he looks in his rearview mirror, and he's surprised to see an RCMP cruiser pulling into the top of the driveway. The officer gets out and approaches Dad, no doubt just as surprised to see him, you know, somebody just sitting in a car in the driveway. Um, so he says to my dad, are you Alan Oliver? And Dad says yes, and um, the officer hands him a piece of paper, and he says there's a, a Mr. Ed Murphy trying to get a hold of you. And here's his number, you know, can you contact him? So dad goes uh, into the house and talks to mom and they're both scratching their heads and they, they have no idea who this Ed Murphy might be. Um, mom finally surmises that she thinks it could be her dad's cousin who unbeknownst to her is living in Canada now. Uh, so the next day, mom uh, goes to the uh, Manatee Library to use the pay phone, as you do when you don't have a house phone. And uh, she phones Uncle Ed and, uh, you know, makes arrangements. And sure enough, uh, a few days later, Uncle Ed, Aunt Rita, and three of their kids come out with a big bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And, uh, well, Uncle Ed takes one look at where we are staying and he says, Alan, you've got to get out of this place. Uh, the Murphys uh, very generously came through and offered us their basement to live in for two weeks until our townhouse was available. My father never did achieve his dream of owning his own farm. Uh, he did successfully make the transition in Ottawa from farming to transportation. He was able to advance within motorways. Uh, Mum was able to find nursing positions in Ottawa uh, at a couple of part-time positions at first and then, and then full-time. Claire Van Farm was uh, condemned by the government and uh, closed down and uh, the uh, shack we lived in was torn down um, and uh, the Murphys uh, moved, uh, we think perhaps back to California, uh, we lost track of them but we'll never forget their generosity and kindness. In 1974 our family all became proud Canadian citizens and we've lived happily in Canada ever since. No, we have no regrets about coming to Canada, um, despite the, uh, the difficult start. I concur with, my, with Anne that uh, our life really began when we arrived in Canada. <laughs>